The German blue ram has the unfair reputation of being a difficult fish to maintain and breed. While they're not a good choice for the beginner, there is nothing especially difficult about their care. The first and perhaps most important ingredient for success is to start with quality fish. And that's not as simple as you might think, because the typical mass-produced German blue rams that you find in the local pet store are not a good way to start. German blue rams from large-scale fish farms are usually poor quality fish that are treated with hormones and steroids to make them appear more colorful. The use of these chemicals tends to make the fish sterile. They might spawn, but the eggs rarely develop and the adults live very short lives. It's best to buy locally bred fish if you can, or find a reputable source online with rams that are free of hormones and steroids, preferably one based in your own country. And because it's so important, I'll stress it again, you'll need to start with quality fish. Okay, now that we have that out of the way, let's provide them with a proper home that will keep them happy and healthy. German blue rams need to be kept at a temperature of at least 82 degrees Fahrenheit or 28 degrees Celsius. I keep my rams in the mid 80s. Be sure to use a submersible heater with a manual temperature adjustment that can be set in the high 80 degree range. It's essential that the water parameters in the aquarium remain stable. That means no rapid shifts in temperature, pH, or water hardness. Ammonia and nitrite levels should be at or near zero. That means that it is essential that you have established a stable nitrogen cycle in the aquarium before adding German blue rams. They are very sensitive to poor water quality and even small amounts of ammonia or nitrites can cause health problems. So overfeeding is to be avoided at all costs. It's best to keep nitrates low as well through regular water changes and the use of live plants in the aquarium. In the wild, their water is soft and slightly acidic, but captive bred rams are fairly flexible and will adapt to a wide range of different water parameters. The key to keeping them healthy is stability rather than the perfect pH or water hardness. My rams are raised at a pH of around 6.8, but they can adapt to anything between 5 and 8. Water hardness is a much more important factor, and very hard water is to be avoided because it can reduce egg fertilization and hatching rates. I use small frequent water changes rather than large weekly or bi-weekly changes. I also use a slow drip method to gradually add new water back into the aquarium. This slow and steady approach to water changes helps to ensure that any small fluctuations in their water parameters occur gradually. German blue rams look and feel their best in a densely planted aquarium containing live plants, driftwood, smooth stones, and a dark sand substrate. My rule of thumb in aquarium design for this species is that the fish should be able to hide from view where I can't see them. If the tank doesn't provide for that, then I add more plants or driftwood. Places to hide are important if a pair starts to fight. Then it's helpful to provide a place for a weary combatant to hide for a while. In addition to their requirements of warm, stable water conditions, rams also need calm water and will not appreciate having to battle a strong current. Here's a simple 5-gallon aquarium setup that I use to breed this pair of rams. It consists of a 5-gallon tank with a sponge filter designed for a 40-gallon aquarium. The output on the filter is minimal in order to reduce turbulence in the tank. 
The aquatic plants consist of two large clumps of Suswasertang and a small Anubius plant. There's also a small rock for egg laying, a black sand substrate, and a submersible heater. Always be sure to use a cover on the aquarium to reduce evaporation, keep out contaminants, and help maintain a stable water temperature. I recommend using a 20 gallon aquarium for a pair of these fish. They can be kept in smaller aquariums, but larger volumes of water provide more stability, which the rams will appreciate. Incorporating lots of living plants and several pieces of driftwood into your aquarium design will help the fish feel more at ease, reduce stress, and allow them to display more natural behaviors. If you plan on breeding this species, it would be best to find a quiet location for the tank. Avoid areas with lots of foot traffic and vibrations which might stress the fish or cause them to panic and eat their eggs or the fry. Placing area rugs near the aquarium can be helpful in reducing unwanted vibrations. German Blue Rams will survive and reproduce in a bare tank using nothing but a sponge filter, a heater, and a clay pot. This type of aquarium is a great way to keep the water clean, but a terrible way to enjoy such a beautiful fish. The easiest way to recognize a female is by her pink abdomen. And here comes the male, no pink abdomen. The females also have several shiny spots, which are often referred to as spangles, inside the large black spot located on their side. The black spot on the male has no shiny spangles inside it. However, due to the iridescent scales on these fish, shiny dots similar to those seen in the female's black spot can come and go as the fish moves through the water. This fish is a male. Watch the black spot as he moves and you'll see iridescent scales or spangles come and go. These are often confused with the shiny spots that appear inside the female's black spot. However, to my eyes, they look quite different. Another indicator of the sex lies in the shape of the dorsal fin, so let's take a quick look at that. Male German blue rams have long extensions on their third and fourth dorsal fin rays. Counting these rays can be tricky because there's a small one hidden in the front on both sexes that is often overlooked. Nonetheless, it's always the third and fourth rays on both sexes that come into question. Some people also cite the extensions on the ventral fins and the shape of the anal fin as indicators of sex, but I find those methods to be less reliable. And here's another male. This is a female. Notice that her third and fourth dorsal fin rays also have extensions on them, but nothing near as long as the males. Another indicator of the sex lies in the shape of the breeding tubes that appear on both sexes just before they spawn. This is the female's breeding tube. It's also known as an ovipositor or a papilla. It's thicker than the male's breeding tube in order to allow eggs to pass through it and onto the surface where the eggs are being laid. The male's breeding tube is narrow and pointy. It's designed to help the male direct his milk towards the eggs as he goes about fertilizing them. 
The final indicator of the sex is that the males are larger than the females, with the males reaching a length of nearly three inches, while the females max out around two and a quarter. Accurately determining the gender of young German blue rams is difficult, but becomes much easier once they begin to reach sexual maturity at around three months of age. I find it easiest to spot the females first by looking for the pink abdomen as well as the shiny dots in their black spots. In the wild, German blue rams forage for small prey items by taking in mouthfuls of substrate and sifting through it to remove tiny invertebrates. Today, we're settling for fish flakes. Rams are easy to feed and most will readily take a wide range of prepared foods. However, it's also important to feed sparingly because rams are very sensitive to poor water quality and a buildup of uneaten food can cause deadly spikes in ammonia and nitrite levels. Feeding them every other day can help keep waste products under control. In fact, it's beneficial to both the biological filtration as well as the fish themselves to have brief periods of time without the influx of food. This will help to ensure that the biological filtration is keeping pace with the production of waste. Finally, as with all fish, it's important to give them a varied diet. These are white worms. They're not aquatic, so feed sparingly. Black worms are a better choice because they're aquatic. Still, they seem a bit large for the rams to handle easily. German blue rams begin to reach sexual maturity at around three or four months of age. This is when they'll start to form monogamous pairs with each pair claiming a small area as their own. Together, they work to defend the site and drive away intruders. This will be the place where they lay their eggs. They also excavate several small depressions in the sand that will be used as holding areas for the newly hatched wrigglers and the young fry. At night, the fry are gathered in a small group at the bottom of one of these depressions. This pair had at least six of them scattered throughout their five-gallon aquarium, but most of their effort was spent working on a single large depression just to the left of the rock where they are going to spawn. Providing a sand substrate for your German blue rams will give you the opportunity to observe natural behaviors that might otherwise be missed. A finer grade of sand in this aquarium would have been a better choice than the relatively large grain sand that I'm using here. This young couple have been diligently cleaning this rock for several days now. 
The female's abdomen is rounded with eggs, and her breeding colors are on full display. Be sure to notice how the female is rubbing her breeding tube along the surface of the rock. It's a sure sign that she will begin laying her eggs soon. The male seems to be growing impatient and keeps pushing up against the female's abdomen. And now, she's ready to begin laying her eggs. The eggs are very sticky and will immediately be glued to the rock upon contact. And here it goes, now. And there it is, the first egg has appeared. One by one, she will use her breeding tube to gently place each egg on the rock. The male will follow along behind her and fertilize the eggs. The entire process will take about an hour and a half to complete. At 86 degrees, these eggs will hatch in approximately 38 hours into a tiny, non-swimming larval stage known as a wriggler. If the parents are inexperienced or being housed improperly, they may eat the eggs, the wrigglers, or the fry. Some pairs learn how to raise their young after two or three failed attempts, while others never seem to get the hang of it. However, if the conditions are suitable, many German Blue Ram pairs are able to successfully raise their own young. There is a defective egg. It shouldn't be moving like that. After about an hour and a half, they're done spawning. Now we're going to switch gears for a little bit and take an intimate look at the eggs and their development. Then we'll get back to these two adults and see what happens next. In the beginning, the eggs are fairly uniform in color and firmly attached to the stone. Each egg has one end that is lighter colored than the other. 
The lighter colored end is where the sperm will enter the egg through a very tiny hole known as the micropyle. This is the side of the egg where the first cells will begin to divide through a process known as mitosis and the embryo will begin to form. Here are three eggs where the location of the micropyle can be seen as a dark spot inside a light colored ring. The white area at the top of each of these eggs is the beginnings of a tiny German blue ram. And beneath that we find the yolk that nourishes the tiny fish during its development. And holding the whole thing together is a thin semi-permeable membrane known as the Chorion layer. The Chorion layer creates a stable microenvironment for the developing embryo while still allowing for the exchange of fluids and gases between the embryo and the outside world. The separation between the Chorion layer and the other parts of the egg can be seen more clearly here. The developing embryo is this long ridge of lighter colored cells sitting on top of the yolk. These eggs develop very quickly. Here are these same exact eggs from a slightly higher angle just 16 hours later. Our little fish have now developed some color and have started moving their tails. The tail develops quickly and is the strongest part of the body. Fittingly, it's the tail muscles that will be used to break free of the Chorion layer at the moment of birth. The egg seen here failed to develop. Luckily, fungus does not seem to be much of an issue with ram eggs. Thirty-eight hours after they were laid, the eggs are starting to hatch. They hatch tail first, while the rest of the body typically remains inside the Chorion layer. This ball and socket arrangement helps them to remain in one place when they first hatch. However, this arrangement is brief and they eventually wriggle their way out of the Chorion layer. At this point in their development, they don't have a mouth, fins, or eyes. They also don't have any gills to extract oxygen from the water, so breathing is done through their skin. This is the most delicate stage of their lives, but they have a remarkable adaptation that helps them swing the odds in their favor. Let's take a closer look. Here's an Anubius leaf with newly hatched wrigglers on it. Some are held in place because they are still caught inside the Chorion layer, while others are being held in place by something else altogether. With all of the wriggling that these little fish are doing, they should be wriggling themselves right off of this leaf. This one is not going anywhere anytime soon, but his friend to our right is slipping away. Be sure to notice the heartbeat on the wriggler in the center of your screen, as well as the still developing eye on the wriggler to your right.
And off he goes. Let's move ahead now to 48 hours in the future. This little one has wriggled itself right off the edge of the Anubius leaf. The only thing keeping it in place now are several sticky threads that are attaching it to the edge of the leaf. These threads are produced by special glands located on the crown of the head known as adhesive glands. The adhesive glands are transient structures only appearing for a short time during the early stages of development. They appear just before hatching and then disappear around one week of age. There are four adhesive glands on the crown of the head, and each is lined with special mucus-producing cells known as goblet cells. There are also three or four less prominent adhesive glands located between the eyes. Many species of cichlids have these glands in the early stages of their development, and they've proven to be a very useful adaptation. For instance, in habitats where there are low levels of dissolved oxygen, some species will gather up the wrigglers in their mouth and then place them in aquatic vegetation growing near the surface of the water, where there is more dissolved oxygen. The fry are then kept in place by the sticky threads produced by the adhesive glands. In this case, it's just keeping this little one attached to the glass. If this little wriggler were under the care of its parents, one of them would have grabbed it by now and brought it back to the rest of the group. That worm-like creature on the glass is not a planaria or a detritus worm. It moves a bit like a leech. And now for some comic relief, courtesy of the adhesive gland. Those star-shaped black spots are pigment-bearing cells known as chromatophores. They will provide the rainbow of colors and iridescence on our adult fish. The pigments in these cells can move rapidly from one part of the cell to another. When the pigments in the cell come together and are more concentrated, the color becomes more vivid. When the pigments in the cells disperse, the fish appear pale. These white dots inside the skull are known as otoliths. Fish have three pairs of them. They are tiny pieces of calcium carbonate that sit suspended in a thick fluid inside a chamber in the inner ear known as the vestibule. All vertebrates have otoliths and they provide the brain with vital information about the body's movement and orientation. Otoliths increase in size each year and can be used to determine the age of a fish. The otoliths in fish are relatively large when compared to humans. Humans only have two and they're very tiny. And now I thought I'd put a little heart into this production. Fish have a two-chambered heart, while there are four chambers in the human heart. This little one is obviously very excited about it. 
In another 24 hours or so, this wriggler will start swimming and officially become a fry. Well, that now concludes our look at some of the more interesting anatomical features that can be seen in both the eggs and the wrigglers. Now we can get back to the adults and their eggs. After spawning, both parents work together to guard the eggs, keep them clean, and make sure that they're well oxygenated. Upon hatching, the eggs will be moved by both parents to one of the many depressions in the sand that they've created just for this occasion. It's important not to startle or disrupt the parents as this will sometimes cause them to panic and eat the eggs or the fry. Try to minimize foot traffic near the aquarium and keep movement in the room to a minimum. If this is a concern, one possible solution is to create a privacy blind around the aquarium in order to minimize disruptions to the fish. Adding a dither fish to the aquarium can sometimes be helpful as well. In this case, I'm using a small bristlenose placostomus as my dither fish. The idea behind the use of a dither is that the rams will perceive the relatively harmless Placostomus as a threat to their offspring. This perceived threat will then encourage better parenting behavior in the rams. I'm not sure that it was necessary in this case, but it did create for a bit of excitement. The bristlenose hides under the sponge filter most of the time and the rams make sure that he keeps his distance. But now, with eggs in the aquarium, they're really on high alert. The leaf seen here is from an oak tree. It has been placed in the aquarium to provide more cover for the pleco as well as to make the water a little more acidic. The eggs are starting to hatch and the parents have begun to move the babies to a new location. And what you are now witnessing is a remarkable example of cooperative parenting. The female gathers up the babies from the stone while the male waits impatiently at the new location guarding the babies that have already been moved. Then they switch roles. The female brings her babies to the new location and then stands guard, while the male gathers up the children from the stone, and neither group of babies is left unguarded for very long. These cichlids display incredibly complex social skills and are able to work effectively as a team in order to accomplish a common goal. Let's take a closer look. This pair is not wasting any time waiting for the eggs to hatch and have taken to nipping at the egg's chorion layer until it breaks. Then they remove the wriggler from the egg and bring it to a new location. 
be sure to notice the egg-shaped Torian layer that's being left behind. This seems like a very rough way to be brought into the world. Now let's take a look at what's happening at the other end of the aquarium. The wrigglers are being transported to a small depression in the sand at the rear of the tank. These depressions in the substrate are used as staging areas for the wrigglers who won't be able to swim for another three or four days. The wrigglers may be moved to a different location several times per day, so if you can't find them, don't panic. The parents may move them to a new area of the tank. Keep your eye on the male's pectoral fin. Twenty-four hours later and the parents have moved their family to the front of the aquarium. As you may recall, the newly hatched wrigglers don't have functioning gills, so they breathe through their skin. As a result, they need to have the water around them kept in motion. The parents solve that problem by taking turns fanning the wrigglers. These tiny wrigglers could easily be swept away by the strong currents required to keep them properly oxygenated. The problem is solved by the sticky threads that come out of their adhesive glands. These threads help the wrigglers stick to the substrate as well as to each other. Now let's look at these same wrigglers a couple days later. The wrigglers are just three days old now. They have a bit more color and their yolk sacs are nearly gone. The adhesive glands on the crown of the head are still clearly visible and functioning. These wrigglers are kept on a coarse sand substrate. If the rams were kept on a gravel substrate, there would be the very real danger of the wrigglers becoming trapped between the large pore spaces in the gravel. They're starting to swim for short distances now, and this will make the task of looking after them much more of a challenge. The pair have now gathered their young on the same rock they were born on just three days ago. And then suddenly, there's motion in the leaves. The bristlenose pleco must be nearby. The female swims off to investigate, while the male stays behind to look after the fry. It seems that his main concern right now 
is me. As his children grow and become better swimmers, the job of looking after them will become increasingly difficult. I've seen them carry as much as a dozen fry in their mouth at one time. And this little one thinks he's gotten away. As soon as the fry can swim, both parents will escort them through the aquarium in search of food. German blue ram fry are very small and will need some very small things to eat. The ideal food in the first few days is a group of very tiny animals known collectively as infusoria. I don't have the space and the time to culture infusoria, so I rely on microworms, specially formulated fry food, and baby brine shrimp. The worms seen here are microworms. The fry have been free swimming for two days now, and they seem to be having some difficulty eating the full grown microworms, and many of the fry are just avoiding the larger ones altogether. And this is why infusoria is a better food choice than microworms for very young fry. Microworms are not aquatic, so feed in moderation because any that are left uneaten will eventually die and degrade your water quality. Here they are eating baby brine shrimp, and they seem to be having some difficulty with these as well. Brine shrimp must be used quickly after hatching because they grow rapidly and lose nutritional value. The San Francisco brine shrimp eggs are reported to produce some of the smallest baby shrimp. Nonetheless, an abundance of small food items going into the aquarium may contribute to a rapid population increase in other small, less desirable creatures. This freshwater relative of the jellyfish, known as a hydra, is one example of just such a creature. Each of its tentacles is lined with stinging cells that contain a powerful neurotoxin designed to immobilize and kill its tiny victims. And this aquarium is full of potential victims. Hydra normally eat much smaller prey items than fry, items like Daphnia and Cyclops. I imagine that many of you were secretly hoping to see one of these fry caught by a hydra. However, I never saw it happen. The female has spotted the bristlenose placostomus and sounds the alarm by flicking her fins repeatedly. The bristlenose spends a lot of time underneath a sponge filter and the parents are more nervous than usual when their fry are in this part of the aquarium.
And now the male sounds the alarm by repeatedly flicking his fins. It's amazing how they can swim sideways underneath the filter. Here, the male uses his pectoral fin to create a current that dislodges one of the fries so that he can grab it. German blue rams can produce large spawns of 200 or more fry, so it's best to be prepared well ahead of time. At this point, you should already have a 10-gallon tank up and running with a sponge filter and a stable nitrogen cycle waiting for these fry. It's also important to remember that it's better to raise 20 healthy fry in a spacious aquarium than it is to raise 200 stunted fish that are grown in cramped conditions. The parents have lost all control at this point. In the wild, these fry would be able to swim away just a few at a time and begin lives of their own. But in the confines of the aquarium, the maturing fry are trapped. Remove the fry at around two to three weeks of age before the parents are driven to spawn again. If you fail to remove the fry in time, they will probably be viewed as a threat and eaten by their parents. Younger pairs will spawn more frequently than older fish, so you will need to remove their fry sooner than older rams. I typically remove the fry at two weeks old using a small siphon hose. Young rams can breed frequently. In fact, my most recent pair of four-month-old German blue rams laid eggs every eight days on average for approximately two months. This little fry is just nine days old and growing quickly on a steady diet of baby brine shrimp and microworms. Providing the fry with lots of space and clean water in the mid-80 degree range will help to increase their growth rate. Here's a fry at 16 days old. That shiny bubble is the swim bladder. The fry seen here are about two months old, they are approaching sexual maturity, and fittingly they have become more colorful, more territorial, and more aggressive. They'll reach sexual maturity at around three to four months of age, but don't develop their full array of colors until they're about six or seven months old. I've had young females just over an inch in length produce small spawns, so they can start breeding well before they develop their full coloration.
The iridescent reds, blues, and greens are the last colors to appear. Be sure to notice how the chromatophores are lining up to create a series of vertical bands, one of which will form the large black spot that is used to help determine the sex of the fish. Day after day, this female's colors will continue to brighten and spread until she contains nearly every color in the rainbow. This female is about eight months old, and if properly cared for, she can live to be about two years old. However, it's my understanding that many people have trouble getting their rams to live for more than a year. There are several varieties of German blue ram. These varieties include the gold rams, electric blue ram, black ram, and the long thin strains, all of which are more difficult to keep and may live shorter lives. And now it's time to do a quick review of what I think are the key ingredients needed to keep these beautiful fish happy and healthy. Unless there's a problem, the only water parameter that I keep track of is the temperature. However, for the purpose of this video, I measured my total dissolved solids and got an average reading of 62 parts per million. My pH hovers around 6.8 to 7. I suggest using rainwater if you need to soften your tap water. And to increase the acidity, try adding oak leaves. It's simple, costs nothing, and it's non-toxic. Rams are pretty docile for a cichlid, so they can go in a community tank. However, since rams are sensitive fish with a requirement for high temperatures, combining them with other fish is best done by tailoring everything around the rams and their preferred water parameters. Guppies and coolie loaches would make nice companions that would be fine with the higher temperatures. Of course, breeding these beauties is best accomplished in a single species setup, and it's my belief that rams live longer when housed by themselves. And now, we've reached the end. My hope is that the information presented here will help you succeed in keeping and breeding these misunderstood South American cichlids. But before you go, I'd like to ask for your help. If you've ever kept German blue rams, how long were you able to keep them alive? Please leave a comment in the box below with your answer. And thanks for watching.